My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, an American ninja warrior in training, and the creator of Optimize Yourself. For over 10 years now, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative and athletic performance, and now I'm here to shorten your learning curve. Whether you're a creative professional who edits, writes, or directs, you're an entrepreneur, or even if you're a weekend warrior, I strongly believe that you can be successful without sacrificing your health or your sanity in the process. You ready? Let's design the optimized version of you. Hello and welcome to the Optimize Yourself podcast. If you're a brand new optimizer, I welcome you and I sincerely hope that you enjoy today's conversation. If you are inspired to take action after listening today, why not tell a friend about this show and help spread the love? And if you're a longtime listener and optimizer OG, welcome back. Whether you're brand new or you're a seasoned vet, if you have just 10 seconds today, it would mean the world to me if you clicked the subscribe button in your podcast app of choice because the more people that subscribe, the more that iTunes and the other platforms can recognize this show, and thus the more people that you and I can inspire to step outside their comfort zones to reach their greatest potential. And now on to today's show. In an ideal world, being a creative professional means that you love what you do and your passion for your work fuels a meaningful and fulfilling life that also has a positive impact on the world. Whether you write, you direct, you produce, you edit, you work on set, that is the dream that we all set out to achieve when we join this industry. In the real world, however, we all quickly discover that that passion can lead to exploitation. Toxic work environments, unreasonable deadlines and schedules, and unrelenting hours extinguish even the deepest, hottest burning passions inside of us. Respect, dignity, and a basic appreciation for the work that we do are essential ingredients in keeping our passion alive and sustaining us through long careers. But unfortunately, these concepts have been pushed aside in favor of faster, cheaper, and better. Today, I am excited to discuss the realities of working on the production side of the industry with Shayla Banks and Nicholas Brown, both of whom work in the costume department and were recently featured with me in the recent Variety article, IATSE crew members share firsthand accounts of set life. Shayla is a costume supervisor who has worked on shows such as The Voice, Insecure, Grownish, and The Oscars. Nicholas has been working in costumes for almost 25 years, and he's worked on films such as Free Guy, The Lake House, and Dukes of Hazard, and TV shows like How to Get Away with Murder, Scandal, and Glee. This honest conversation gets to the very core of the many issues that production crews face while on set. You'll hear candid stories about the horrible conditions and disrespectful behavior that they both endure on a routine basis and how it affects both their health and their relationships. You're also going to hear that despite the enthusiasm they both have for their craft, they also both desperately crave the change that is so necessary in our industry today. The energy from this conversation is palpable, and it's one of the most unique and interesting conversations that I've had on the record in a long time. So if you enjoy this format, please let me know by either leaving a review or emailing me directly. I'm considering doing a lot more interviews just like this one, and I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback. If today's conversation inspires you to take action, pursue more fulfilling work, and design a more balanced life without sacrificing your health, your relationships, or your sanity in the process, then I invite you to subscribe to my brand new weekly newsletter that I'm calling Your Cure for the Case of the Mondays. Every Monday morning, I will share with you my favorite resources, mindsets, strategies, and practical tips to give you more energy so you can be more productive and so you can optimize every facet of your life such that you no longer dread the week ahead, but instead you can't wait for the next Monday morning to start all over again. To subscribe and become the newest member of the revolution, simply visit optimizeyourself.me slash newsletter. All right, without further ado, my conversation with costume supervisor Shayla Banks and costume buyer Nicholas Brown. Made possible today by our amazing sponsor, Ergo Driven, who's going to be featured just a bit later in today's interview. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspirational interview, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. 
I am here today with Nicholas Brown and Shayla Banks, uh, both of whom work in the costume departments in Hollywood in the entertainment industry. Uh, Shayla is a costume supervisor. Nicholas is a costume buyer, works in the costume department. He's worked on films such as Free Guy, The Lake House, Dukes of Hazard. worked on TV shows like How to Get Away with Murder and Scandal. And you may not know it, but we have Glee in common because I did work on uh, Glee for a short period of time way back in the day. Um, Shayla has worked on shows like The Voice and Insecure, Grownish. You've worked on the Oscars. Oscars. Um, and I'm going to be perfectly frank before I introduce you. I have no idea what either of you do for a living. And I have a <laughs> feeling there are going to be some people listening that don't either. And we're going to talk all about that because one of my goals is to start bridging the gap between all the various departments so we can really find unity and cohesion and collectively all work towards the same goals. So on that note, Shayla and Nicholas, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Why, thank you. It's an honor to be here. So, thank you so much, Jack, for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Absolutely. You're more than welcome. And the, the the distinguished connection that all three of us have amongst a few others is that we were all recently featured in an article from uh, Variety Magazine talking all about the human faces of the people that work behind the scenes in production and post-production and otherwise. Uh, at the time the article came out, it was, of course, under the context of why is it that you voted to strike and why are we ready to strike? And God only knows where things are going to be by the time this releases because it's changing hour by hour. But just for context, for anybody that's listening, this is obviously not live. So when it is released, as of the time we're talking, we just averted the strike. It's a few days after the strike. Um, and we thought that we were going to be walking Monday morning. And we find out at the very last minute, nope, a deal has been cut. And hooray, we've won. Oh, hold, hold on a second. Uh, are, are we sure we won? Do, do we know this is what we want? So I think that's, we're going to talk about that a little bit. I don't want to get too much into the finer deal points. I always focus on the bigger picture. So I'm going to lead it by saying that I believe the bigger picture of this negotiation, and frankly, what I've been screaming from the rooftops for years, is that I don't believe the vast majority, if not all of the people that work below the line in Hollywood are either valued or respected as human beings. And I've talked about this ad nauseum incessantly to people in post because that is my world. And I really want to better understand what life looks like on set in the trenches because for a lot of people, it literally is in the trenches every single day. Uh, so I'm going to start with you, Shayla, for no other reason than uh, Zoom decided to highlight your square instead of Nicholas's square. So it's nothing personal, but since you're- she's prettier. Yes, uh, <laughs> but I, I love you equally and you have amazing energy, but I'll just start with Shayla. Uh, so Shayla, could you just start by- by explaining just kind of in, in plain information for anybody um, either that works in production or somebody that doesn't work in production, like what does the day-to-day -day look like for you? What is it that you do for a living so we can get a clearer picture of what it is we're all working for and what it is that we're, we're screaming about from the rooftops with the way this industry works? Okay. So as a costume supervisor, I'm one of the department heads of the costume department which in, is in charge of the overall look of the show for the characters building, uh, character building, uh, background. It depends on whatever show, but we're in charge of that whole aesthetic. And so day to day, I'm um, meeting with producers, the designer. I mean, even hair and makeup, you know, we're having fittings. We are shopping, returning, you know, inventory. It's just you know, continuity goes involved in it. It's a, a big process. I'm booking BG customers all week, you know, depending on the BG numbers, we're sending out, you know, a sheet of what we need, you know, putting boards together. So it's a constant flow in our department that never stops. And it's for, you know, the main look of the show, as far as like people care what they're wearing. It If you look good, you feel good and you perform well, you act well. And so we're the liaison between the actor, the character, and the creator, writer, director, producer, all those people. We are the, per the department that, you know, kind of maneuvers that and even also helps verbalize the vision to hair and makeup because we get prep days and, you know, we're in all the meetings, creative meetings, and sometimes they're not allowed, you know, allotted to are given the days. So we have a huge responsibility. So essentially everything that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is what we're going to see on screen as far as anything that anybody is wearing head to toe had to come through you and your department. Exactly. Yes, definitely. 
I mean, and, and everybody that you see, whether it's background, they're just crossing and you think they just chose somebody on the street. No, they still came through wardrobe. And apparently one of the, the things you need to do is you need a credit card so somebody can go out and shop and buy the stuff that you want. And that, that's what you do, right, Nicholas? You're the, you're the shopper. Isn't that what you were telling me beforehand? That's, what I do. that's all you I'm do? I'm just going to add one thing to Shayla. Yeah. She's also in charge of the budget. Oh. Is a huge, huge part of what costume supervisors do. Budget, breaking down the script, keeping the continuity. Yes, Nicholas, thank you. I was thinking yeah, so absolutely. far. But you yeah, do, you do so much. It's so yeah. easy to leave something out. It's also like the accounting of the department, basically. You're in charge of the budget. You're the person that's saying no, yay, nay, all the time. <laughs> And that's, and so as a costume buyer, I work very closely with the supervisor because, you know, they uh, submit a budget to the producers. And so I have to help them, you stay. know, stay in budget, you know, with what I pull, you know, like if it's, if they budgeted $500 for a character, I'm not going to go to Neiman's you know, to shop that character. Yeah. So I would assume that uh, having been in a, a wide variety of shows that people are going to just assume like, well, I mean, they're wearing t-shirt and jeans. Like, come on. Like, it can't it can't be that costly and that hard to like put a bunch of kids in school in their clothes, right? Like, it's it's got to be a pretty cush job, I would guess. If I had a nickel for every time a producer or director looked at me and said, oh, you, you're the shopper? Oh, my girlfriend's such a great shopper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's the biggest misconception or people always say to me, oh, my God, I love to go to the mall, you know, so I think I would be good at that. And you're just like, yeah, there's so much more that, you know, we do. It's it's crazy. And, you know, you do get it that people don't understand. You think everybody gets stressed every day. And sometimes I've even heard producers say it's so hard when we do try to fight in our union for things because they think. Everyone gets dressed. So how hard could it really be? But, you know, it's a whole art to it because a lot of the times we're shopping out of the season. You're you don't feel summer and summer. You don't film winter and winter, you know, or the reason why they look so good on TV, because we're having fit, fittings, we're having a tailor, we're altering, we're custom making things. So even if it looks like it's off the rack, it nine times out of 10 isn't off the rack. And the other thing that the other major thing that we're always is running against the clock, because the, the longer, you know, at the beginning of COVID, everybody was like, well, now you're gonna have more time with casting, but it's, it's worse than ever. You know, we get, we can, we can get a, a cast member the night before. And, you know, at like five, run out and shop them and then fit them the next morning before they work. Yeah. So you're you're saying that since COVID and the pandemic, things haven't gotten easier for all of you? Because that, that was, isn't that what we were all promised? Less hours and we were going to get taken care of and we were really going to worry about our health? Like, I'm I'm shocked right now to hear all of this. Absolutely shocked. Yeah, I was, I mean, I was on a film technically for a year because it was, we shut down for six months. I started in November of 19 and, and finished in November of 20. And, you know, at the beginning, they were like, we're only going to do online shopping, you know, and that lasted, I would say, two weeks. Wow. Mm. Yeah. You know, and it was because, you know, then like, you know, then the director's like, oh, you know what I'd really like in this scene, you know, the actor goes to set or, you know, that he sees their costume is something completely different. So then it becomes this race against the clock to go out and, you know, I was in Atlanta, which is like a whole extra level of, of difficulty, but, you know, to make this happen. Once again, I'm absolutely shocked by the fact that you neither have the time nor the money to do the job to the best of your abilities. Because it's not that way in post-production at all. We are given all the time and the money that we need. And boy, it's just a vacation, <laughs> an absolute vacation. They're like, take oh, all the time you need to get this cut right. We don't have air dates. We don't have delivery dates. We just want you to do what you need to get it right. If you need more money, you just let us know. Um, so the the point being, if, if anybody can't sense the sarcasm, the sarcasm meter is an overdrive <laughs> right now. Heavy, because heavy on the Exactly. The, the point being that I think it's, it's especially over the last few years, there's been so much separation between the different guilds, the different crafts. And people are like, yeah, well, you don't understand how bad we have. You don't understand how bad we have. And I'm like, hey, guys, we're all eating the same shit sandwich every day and the same person serving it to us. And they want us to fight with each other so we don't look at them. Exactly. Right. And so that's, 
Oh, go ahead. So I don't know how closely you work with like with the director of like if you're doing episodic, if you're working with the director of the episode and the producers. The, the biggest challenge with our department is they have no idea what the process is from the time we get that cast member until the time they walk on set. All they see is the, is the final product. And they have no idea the journey that that costume has gone from, from like the inception to them walking on set. And so nobody really understands how challenging it is. And, you know, in the variety piece, I, I said, I would, I would love for a producer to follow me for one day to really understand what the journey is of a costume. Yeah, and, and I think that applies to probably just about every craft. Um, I know that uh, a lot of times if a, a producer or a director, and uh, just so you guys better understand the role of post, uh, in TV and features, it's a little bit different. But in general, you spend several days working with the director, all the visiting directors of each episode. Um, but really, the majority of my time is spent working for the showrunners. Um, and some showrunners totally understand the creative process and others are very much writers and they're on set producers and they'll ask for things in post-production. They're like, well, I want this, this, and this. And I mean, I'm going to be available later today to look at it. And like, you just asked for four days worth of work. Like that's going to take four 12 hour days to create the version you wanted. Um, but their, their nephew has Final Cut Pro on their laptop. Right, just like you said. Well, my girlfriend's a great shopper. Yeah. Right. Well, and one of the things that I uh, I've said jokingly to to showrunners and producers, um, you know, if I have a good enough relationship, is well, you know, I've I've got Microsoft Word and Excel. I mean, I I can write and budget too. Right. It's, it's the same thing. Um, so I, what I'm trying to highlight is that whether it's costumes, post or anybody else, I think just about anybody listening is like, yes, if they just actually understood what was being asked of us on a day-to-day -day level and what the process looked like, there'd be at least a little bit more, not necessarily allowance of time or money, but a better understanding of why things take longer than they should and how everybody is putting in what I think is beyond their best effort. Because frankly, yesterday's miracle becomes today's expectation over and over and over. And I'm sure it's the same for both of you. Completely. I was on a, a, an episodic show on a network and with uh, an Academy Award winning actress. And when she, when they decided she had time to do a fitting, they would call the supervisor and then literally everybody dropped everything and would go out and like, you know, get the fitting ready. And, you know, sometimes she had like, there was one time we did a crossover and she had 26 changes. Wow. So we had, so we had to pull a fitting for 26 changes in one day. So that day I went out, I was, now it's much harder because you have to make appointments. But at this time I could just go to any of the stores. I go to all the stores. I plan my day really well so that I can get everything done. You know, studio services closes at six and Bloomingdale's closes at seven. And, you know, like I plan my whole day. And I didn't eat lunch because to get this done, I didn't have time to eat. Yes. So on the way home, I go to Chipotle and I get myself or well, on my way back to the studio to drop off the clothes because, you know, sometimes I have a lot of really expensive clothing in my car and I got a, a burrito at Chipotle. And then two days later, the supervisor came to me and he said, um, they kicked back your, your receipt for Chipotle. And I'm like, why? And he said, they don't pay for dinner. <laughs> wow. So I, I marched up to the accountant and I was like, so here's the deal. I was trying to be a team player because production said, this is when the fitting is. And this is the time that I had to get it done. And so you can either pay my meal penalties or you can pay for the $10 burrito. You decide. I think you can guess what they, they decided. Yeah. But the fact that as a supervisor, you always have to fight for those things. They don't get, they don't go Oh, this person, sorry, what is your day looking like? Any consideration? Okay, now this actress is only available all of a sudden from two to four. They don't say, what was your day looking like? What did you guys plan? Is that anybody's lunchtime? It's just, you have to make it happen. Everybody has to, and it's not the actor's fault, the act, you know, you're not saying that, but it's just in the world of this is just what we have to do. And I'm always conflicted as a supervisor that really care about people and my crew and fighting for what's right. That's why I became a supervisor, right? I'm always conflicted. Like this is going against what I know is right. But you that's the battle we have as, well, right now, Shayla, I've gotten into it with many designers. Right now, Shayla, we don't have time to worry about that. We have to do what we have to do. We have to get done. We have to get done. Everybody needs to be back, all hands on deck by two o'clock, 1.30. And you're just like, you know, and so 
Those are the dilemmas we're already, and then it happens. And then, oh, by Friday, they see the time card, which we don't put the real times, but by any chance, somebody might just say, hey, I went to lunch 30 minutes and that's a huge deal. Or like you said, a receipt, because we really don't put enough pen- no penalties, honestly. We've been, it's been drilled in our head, no mill penalties, no mill penalties to the point you even got to go, wait, why? You know, we're in a union for a reason. But you just say like, as a supervisor, you get caught up with saying, please on your way home, get go get something to eat that please go get something to eat or put it on the back end. And then you still have to explain, hey, I thought you guys wrapped at eight, but this person said 8.30. And like you said, you just want to like lose it. Like, excuse me, do you? And it's a cycle. Well, let, let me ask this, because we're, we're really starting to dig right into the heart of the matter, actually much sooner than I anticipated. But like I said, <laughs> we're going to roll with it. I, I want to I wanna talk about the Chipotle receipt specifically. Was it about the $10? Did you really need that $10 reimbursement? Was it about that actual amount of money that you weren't being reimbursed? No, for me, it was about, I didn't take lunch. I didn't eat lunch for production. Yeah. And and that's the whole point here. That's what I really want to dive into is that it's not about, well, you owe me $17.14 for a meal penalty. It's why is my time not being respected? Yeah, That's what this is about. I've talked to many, many editors and assistant editors and people in post over the years that say, What's a meal penalty? So like, I've never had lunch. I eat lunch at my desk every day, but you know, they furnish it. So it's so nice of them. I'm like, have you ever done the math on how much money they're saving by buying your lunch, but keeping you at your desk? And like, I didn't even know it was a thing. Exactly. And the, the, the two areas that I want to dive into are number one, this really isn't about the money. Like I, I saw a whole uh, breakdown in one of the, the Facebook forums where somebody actually shared a spreadsheet. Well, if we get our 3% raise, this is how much we're going to make. But then if we fought for 5%, this is how much we get over the next year. But here's how much we would lose every single day in a strike. Da, 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 da. We're going to lose more money by striking. And everybody vehemently attacks this person saying it's not about the money. It's not Correct. the numbers. No, it's it's respect. about respecting our time, right? Yeah, and it's a respect. It's a consideration. It's even if you were valued and just asked this one time a favor, or I, I really appreciate the hard work, but it's the slap in the face of like, why is there overtime? Why is there a receipt? Or if they allot you $12 and somebody goes over twelve twenty five, or, you know, not keeping up with inflation. I've literally had to write res- uh, checks for being somebody being over 85 cents, $1.25. And like you said, I know these people really aren't taking a lunch. They're driving in their cars, they're running from store to store. And so it's like, as a supervisor, like I said, I feel like, let me write the check, but it's still unfortunate because I'm still sitting at my desk to break down the budget, to keep up with the script, to uh, make all the meetings, to make sure the flow. So, you know, it's just a revolving door of disrespect and not being considerate. And it just like people hit a wall. And at this point, that's what I feel like we've done. We've hit a wall. Absolutely. And like, you know, supervisors get it 10 times harder. You know, my my position is an on-call position because I'm not technically on set with the rest of the crew. So I don't theoretically get meal penalties. Um, You know, that's that's what they say. And, you know, and one of the the biggest things that like I want to touch on today and I'm going to do it now, (laughs) is that- Here's your soapbox, or I'm I'm handing it to you. You know, is that costumers are people pleasers. We we want to help. We want to get things done. And, you know, so many times in my career, um, I've had forced calls, or I've had times where, you know, I had to work extra. And, like, the EPM is like, you know what? Just add it to your, your time card at the end of the week. And the problem with that, when we do that, then when we when the IA goes to negotiate with the producers, the IA says, hey, we have a real problem with forced calls. And then the producers go, that's funny because here are all the reports and there are only 15 forced calls. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So it's this really insidious thing that they do and then they use it against us. You know, when all we're trying to do is help them get this done on time, on budget, and that that's one of the drums that I've been beating for a long time is something I've been writing about for years. And I wrote an article about exactly this three years ago when we were in almost the same position with negotiations, which is that a fair amount of the things that we're fighting for are already protected in a contract. 
we already technically have meal penalties covered and forced calls and all of these other things. We're saying we want this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, guys, we already have all of those things. Yeah. The problem is none of it is being enforced and we're all being exploited and abused yeah. because it's yeah. and what I think it all comes down to. And I want to know if you guys experience this on, on your side as well, but it all comes down to, well, you can either do it this way, or I've got a stack of a hundred people that want to do your job tomorrow morning. And that's what they want to make you believe. But I can tell you without, and it's not my ego, but I've been doing this for 25 years. And what I can do in two hours would take four people yeah. who are, who are, who are in, inexperienced. And I mean, I, like I did a pilot in Hawaii and you, you can guess what pilot that is. I worked 28 days straight because what they would do is they would cast the actors on Friday night and then we would have to shop them on Saturday. And then we had to fit them on Sunday and they worked first thing Monday morning. So, and that was to save money. So they did, so the actors weren't there waiting. So what they did is they, they budgeted to, you know, for me to work seven days a week. And I was exhausted. The, the designer looked at me three weeks in, we were staying at the Hilton Hawaiian village. And she said, have you been to the beach yet? <laughs> <laughs> and the hotel's on the beach. And I said, no, I haven't been yet. And she goes, put down your things. We're going to walk to the beach. Yeah, well, well, I like that person. Uh, but th this brings up uh, a point of clarification I think is going to help both me and anybody else listening that doesn't really understand the demands of the industry. Um, can both of you explain? I'll, I'll go back to you, Shayla, first. Can you just explain? We've learned about the responsibilities that you have. But talk to me, talk to me about a basic day in the life as far as the schedule. Are you beholden to call sheets? Do you work off the call sheet? Because um, there are a lot of people and a lot of the, the discourse that's out there right now is talking about, you know, you start 6 a.m. on Monday morning and then you've got a Friday day and, you know, there's 16, 20 hours in between. You're talking about working 28 days in a row. Um, so just uh, from your perspective in your department, how does your day-to-day -day work as far as the hours and whether or not you're connected to the call sheet or whatever the proper term would be? Well, so our department, we're not connected to the call sheet. Um, our department always has to be there ahead of time. So if there's a general crew call or we base it off of the uh, time the talent is getting in there, as well as a lot of times we have a lot of things. There's notes coming in in the middle of the night. So we can't wait for the general crew, crew call. You are up and at it you know, an hour, half an hour. And that's another thing they'll be like, well, can you NDB? Or we don't want to force call the, all these terminologies. We don't, you know, to get it. They want you to put the general crew call, but they know that you have a ton of work to do because things have changed. One producer finally looked at everything after everybody's gone through the chain of command and liked it and then said, oh my God, it said the red shirt. Could we do a, get a purple shirt? And you're like, we don't have the keys to them all. But we somehow make it happen. So everybody gets in. We get in really early. Lunch does not apply to us. They don't they don't build lunch for the departments. It's we have to have it on paper almost. So if there's a lunch, you know, after the general crew call at the six hour, we've already been there ahead of time. So that means we will already be in Bill penalty when lunch is there. But when lunch is called, that's then when we have to stand by the actor's door, get their clothes, reset for, you know, if they're wearing the change after lunch, somebody might want to get out and you have to steam it again, clean it, or, you know, set the uh, trailer for the next look. It's a whole system that we're constantly working. It's not like, please eat and sit down. It's a producer might say also, hey, we're changing the schedule around. We don't get to sit and eat lunch. And if you're changing one scene to the next, that's a whole process. We already set the trailers, maybe, or we've already had the next look in line. We have to revamp. It's a whole process. And so we are not, when they call cut, we have to wait for the actors to get out of some time here and makeup, then our wardrobe then shower or whatever, because the rooms need to be cleared out, but you can't rush the actor. So, you know, but then they're rushing you to get off the clock, but you're like, I have to do these things 
to be prepared for the next morning. Yeah. So you can't be like, uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. De Niro, I'm going to need you to rush because I'm about to hit my 12 hours. If you could just not take your shower so I can uh, get yeah, that. My 12 hours, my turnaround, my this. So you have all these demands and nobody, they don't fit in a schedule. As a supervisor, we have these conversations at the beginning and everybody like, this is what we need to make our day. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. But as soon as that, like the day before the prep day or whatever goes, you hear it slowly throughout the day being out the window and you're trying to like, excuse us, costumes. And it's like, at that point, you're so small to the bigger picture. It's like, yeah, you're like telling them you're building the schedule so tight. We need time to change the actor from one look to another look. It's not on us. We have the clothes ready, but the actor needs time. The, they're going to go to hair and makeup with this and they say, OK, but they don't build this time in. So it always leaves us in a panic, a scramble, uh, costumes run a set. Uh, we don't want a whole camera. And you're like, but you didn't allot the right amount of time. And then you added a change or the actress said, you know what, today I don't even really feel like wearing these shoes. We have to change it on the fly. So that takes a little time. But it's always just costumes, costumes. And it just is this environment of panic, of haste, of there's no time for anything in the world. And along that, you have to think of no milk penalties, take a lunch, get off the clock, don't work past 12, uh, drive home safely, make your turn around. Like you're like. So and I, I think that the, the, the really important point for people to understand that are either not in the industry at all or even, frankly, most people that don't understand how production works is that let's say that you were to, to look at a, a daily report and it says call time was 7 a.m. camera wrap or, you know, final uh, shot was at 647 p.m. You're like, oh, a 12 hour day. I mean, it you know, it's, it sounds rough, but, you know, a 12 hour day is not the worst thing in the world. If I see a 12 hour day on paper, what does your day look like? Like what, how many hours have you actually worked knowing that you had to show up before and you probably had to sit around and wait after? Yeah. Um, I would say it depends on the position, but it definitely can look like a 16 hour day. Easily. You, you can add about a few hours to e any day. It's going to look like a 16 hour day if it's a real 12 hour day. And like you said, to sum it up for people that don't know any, basically, like you said, if it says seven to six forty seven, there's things that happen every day in our business and in life, period. But the thing is, the best way to describe it is no matter what goes on, we never get more time. We're still trying to fit within this perfect schedule, which doesn't happen the day of, we're not going to get more time, basically. So you're going to fit whatever you can, whatever. Any changes they make, they want to change the actress shirt five times, we're not getting more time. We're walking a set with the change. We're, you know, so that's the best way to describe it. We're never going to be considered and say, hey, we totally understand that we changed the order that we were shooting in today. Take your time. Right. No. Right. So at the beginning of my career, I worked on a vampire show. So I would get that. I, I was the trailer costumer. So the trailer costumer is the costumer who sets and wraps yeah. the costumes. So they have longer hours. And is... And is a you know sometimes psychologist for for the cast, and I we get on Monday morning. I arrived at four forty two because the the schedule is broken up into six minute increments. So I get in at at five forty two. Then they would have their first rehearsal at five or at seven, sorry, and then we would shoot for the day. So now on that show, there were a lot of uh, actors who wore uh, makeup appliances. So they would have to go to the makeup trailer. They'd have to be very carefully removed because they would use them over and over again for the entire episode. And then they would take a shower and then I could wrap their costume. So it could be I, on that show. And then, you know, every day, because it's a vampire show, we start later. And then on Friday, we start at four or five get out at, you know, the rest of the crew's gone at six. You know, we'd be there writing up laundry until seven. Let, let's just specify, you're talking right? six and seven a.m. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's be very clear exactly. to people that are that have bankers hours. They, they don't understand. Exactly. Like, well, that doesn't sound no. too bad. Well, yeah. Yeah, but on Friday, we would start at like five or six p.m. And then we would go, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours until the next morning. And then I'd have to be 
at work at 442 on Monday. And what is that called for anybody that's uninitiated that uh, has been a very hot button okay. topic lately? One, two, three. Friday. Friday. <laughs> I believe that's called a frater day. And the reason I want to get into this more is I really want to help people understand, first of all, the fact that some people are saying that for anybody that's uninitiated or doesn't really follow this, it's just, you know, listening for the, the shock value of the nightmare that is working in Hollywood. For people that don't understand what a turnaround is, a turnaround is from the time that you quote unquote rap, there's a minimum amount of time before you can be asked to come back. And people right now are celebrating the fact that, oh, my God, everybody universally gets a 10 hour turnaround. Can you imagine any other industry where they're saying, oh, my God, we only have to be expected to work 14 hours in a day? That's amazing. But then the other reason I wanted to bring up the nuances is that a 14 hour day is that amount we talked about from call to wrap. So if you get a 10 hour turnaround, you've probably worked 16 hours instead of 14 hours. So if you add an hour on the back end of the night and an hour on the front end of the morning, your turnaround is maybe seven, eight hours which is more than enough time to drive home and commute back, which in Los Angeles, really easy. See family, take care of doctor's appointments, pay your bills, go out with your friends, right? Like the, the numbers are astonishing. And the fact that anyone, anyone says that 10 hours is a victory needs yeah. to have their head examined. And the, the, but, but we've been so like a couple of yeah, to wear like 10 hours. And that's the thing. It's like, even when I speak or now, like Nicholas said, 25 years or 20 years for me, it's, you love what you actually do, but you get on these soapboxes or the way the treatment makes you feel or sound like you don't love what you have to do. And that's the dilemma uh, that I've been in the last couple of years or since the pandemic. It's like, why should I fa- sacrifice something that I've worked so hard that what I love to do, I wouldn't, I don't see myself doing anything else, you know, maybe different positions in the costume department, but as, as a whole working in film and entertainment, but now the way I'm being treated or this, I have to second guess and I have to sound like, Oh my God, do you hate your job? Do you hate what you do? You're so lucky. You, And it's like, it's not about that. Like we said, it's about the respect and treatment and we shouldn't have to compromise one or the other. You know, like if you want to do this, this is just how you have to be treated. And if not, like you said, we have a hundred other people that would love to do this, you know, other than work at a desk job or, and it's like, even people that if you work in corporate, you should be treated with respect. And there's a way to get it done. You know, there's a way that we can get treated better. We can like not rejoice over 10 hours, like just be a good human being and say, Hey, like, I don't want after the fifth day or the fourth day of you guys working 14, 16 hours, just to give you 10 hours. But, but by the time you get home, that's six to seven hours. I want to just do what's right. Hey, 12 hours it is, or cut a day short, but it's too much to ask for for that. Yeah. Well, like, one time my family, you know, said, like I was saying I was tired and they're like, hey, you make such a good living. And I'm like, but the, but the thing people need to realize is we're working two jobs. Yeah. In one it's, week. Yeah. One week, it's like we're working two jobs. You know, the average American does not work, you know, on that show that I was talking about, I was working 80 hours a week. You know what I mean? Like that's two full-time jobs. So it's the quality. 40 more hours more than the average American. That's not healthy. That, there's, there, it's impossible to, to live a healthy life and work those kinds of hours. Especially long-term. So here, here's the thing, Shayla and Nicholas. Here's the part you guys don't understand. This is just the way it is. It just is. This, this is just the way that it is in Hollywood. And if you can't hack it, if you can't suck it up, if you can't cut it, you know what? Why don't you go get your cushy nine to five jobs in the office? Because this is just the way it is in Hollywood. Yeah. Right. And, and, like, yeah. and people should have to make that choice. Yeah. Which, like Shane said, we love what we do. And I think there's a new generation, not meaning we're all of the same age. I just think culturally uh, there's a new time and, the pandemic, I think, helped. It made people sit back and, you know, even though it felt like the biggest, you know, blunder, of course, you don't, you know, people losing loved ones, health, losing their life, that's tragic. Uh, You know, I don't wish that on anybody. But what came out of that, you know, is we got to sit back and you got to spend time at home or with your loved ones or people that have kids or family or, you know, grandmother, you know, just the quality of life. And you go, 
hey, like I made it through off my savings or unemployment or yes, did I make less? Was less money coming in? But you felt happier. You felt rested. You got to focus on your health, your well-being, your your bills. You know, it was just like, oh, my God, let me catch up. I don't know what to do. Like and so, you know, even for me, it's like I moved to Corona like right before the pandemic. I I was like raised half in L.A., half here. And so I ended up buying a house a little bit before the pandemic. And the biggest thing it was like, you're going to see. And I'm like, well, I'm tired of paying for a one bedroom house. I mean, a one bedroom apartment in L.A. Yes, it's closer to work, but I want a better quality of life. I want a house. I want to live in a great neighborhood. I want to, you know, have a lawn and, you know, in a community I'm working like what am I working for? you know, like a quality of life. So it's like my sacrifice is, of course, now I commute, you know, so I'm on the road a lot longer. So my turnaround is no turnaround, but I do feel like, oh, I just can't complain. This is, it is what it is. This is a business I chose, but it's like all these variables that it's like, we're busting our butt to be able to afford apartments and different things in Los Angeles. And if not, you have to move 60 miles away to just, you know, like, Great. I want a, a be, I want a better quality of life, but now that's going to cause commute, less sleep. You know, so you're just like, I'm just trying to figure it out. And I'm get, I'm guessing anybody that's listening that doesn't live in Los Angeles are like 16 miles. That, that you're complaining about a 16 mile commute. It's like just try 16 miles in Los no, Angeles. 60, mine is 60 oh. plus. But like 60. Oh, yours is 60. I was going to say no, even 16, 16 no. is murder no, in Los Angeles. GPS and you're like 16 an hour and a half. Like. Yeah. So picture me. But I just was like, it is what it is. Like I have to. That makes me feel better to say you're working 80 hours or this amount of hours. At least you have a home like there's people that will never be able to get a home or living paycheck to paycheck because they have to live close to home because of the hours, because of the turnaround that they're not getting, because, you know, they can't fathom living further because it's just like I got to just work, 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 work. I have no off time. So it's just catch 22 thing that we're just trying to figure it out. And we're just like, we're not asking for a lot. You know, and the thing, the cost of living in Los Angeles is, that's the other thing. Like not just the traffic is, you know. Horrendous. Poopy, but yeah, exactly. It's like the cost of living in Los Angeles is legit. It's, it's rough. You know, I was talking to my parents. I mean, a lot of customers I know are moving to Atlanta or New Orleans because they just, they, they want to have the money to raise their kids. And the, the other thing that we spend so much money on to also that I just want to bring up is fixing ourselves. I spend so much money on massages and self-care because, you know, I, at the beginning of my career, I fell off a trailer and broke my knee. So like now I have arthritis in one of my knees. You know, it's like things like that. We're, we're do, uh, doing all these things to try and keep ourselves mobile and functional to like keep, you know, stay on this never ending hamster wheel of, of production. Yeah. Cause we actually use, use our body. It's a very physical job. Like a lot of people joke, say we're professional schleppers, you know, <laughs> they're never like, even in my personal life now, sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to make five trips to the car from the grocery store. So I have 10 bags and I'm like, oh, this is nothing. I do it. We do it all day at work. But it's like, yes, you think, you know, people have carpal tunnel, arthritis, back pain, neck pain, and things that you used to think was a luxury, massages, you know, uh, acupuncture, those aren't luxuries anymore. You're like, it's day, it's monthly maintenance. Just I'm, to, sure, I'm sure for editors, there are th- like carpal tunnel things that... Yeah. You know, a lot. Oh, of- yeah. I, I spent the, the first several years building this program. It's funny because we have the opposite problem where you guys are saying you're professional sleppers. Mm-hmm. We are essentially extensions of our workstations. We're just human keyboards that live and yeah. breathe yeah. and we never move. And I spent several years building an entire fitness program and movement program just to help editors get out of the chair and move around. Yeah. Because there's nothing more detrimental for your creativity. And we need to use our creativity for a living. We can't use it if we're not moving in the 
there's no blood circulation and no oxygen. So in that sense, we have the exact opposite problem where there's no movement, but still somebody listening thinking, oh, well, it must be nice to go to the massages and the acupuncture. It's like, you don't understand. Like this is absolute necessity. So we don't fall to pieces. This yeah. is no different than, well, you know, if I don't change the oil in my car and rotate my tires, I can't get right. to work anymore. Yeah. It's not, exactly. oh, I'm, I'm going to the auto detailer and getting another shiny coat of wax. It's I need to make sure I don't break down on the road every single day. And it still happens. And as as I'm sure that uh, you can talk about uh, as well, I mean, I have plenty of people that I know who have either literally lost their lives because of the job or their quality of life is so degraded because of the years and years they put in. And in production, it's so much worse where at least now the stories are coming out. Um, not so much like, oh, that's this one anecdote from 20 years ago on Pleasantville. It's like, no, you don't understand. I know a guy that died behind the wheel last week. Like it's happening all the time, but nobody talks about it no it's it's really unfortunate um i was on a show in the beginning of my career like the right hand person to the designer and the stories that we have from that you know just within that department it's just like i know i remember one of the guys getting in a bad accident and it was on a show day and this was more of live television so you know you can only imagine how important then they feel that is to you know live he got in a bad accident though. And this is when I really started to open my eyes, like, whoa, what type of business is it, am I in? And I was just like, are you okay? And da, da, da. And like when the designer heard and whoever else supervised, it was more about who can run and go get those clothes, that bag of clothes or get him. We need this stuff back by six because we have a live show. And I was like, whoa, like, you know, it, it it was bizarre. And it was always things like that happening. Like the craft service lady that had been on her that show doing multiple shows for that network and the production company, they loved her. But it was when President Obama at the time was in office, you know, maybe the first term. So, you know, when he comes to town or any president or any, it just tears up the streets of LA, which we don't need any more problems. So it's like, she really just, she got back in time for you know, whatever the main before the show, but it was, you know, the green room wasn't completely set up and it just was out of her control. And I promise you the next day I saw her and she was packing up and I was like, Hey, what's going on? And she was like, yeah, they let me go. And I was like, she's like, yeah, I was a little late for the green room. Most important people, you know? Um, And she was just like, but there was no understanding there. It happened this week. Uh, I was talking to a friend the other day. A PD got in a car accident on their way home. Wow. They hit a truck. Yeah, these are I mean, real stories. they're fine. Yeah. But this is... This is real. Yeah, this is real stories. And I was just like, you know, so I always try to, you know, be the voice of the people I've gotten. And I always feel like I have to, to protect yourself and other people. You have to come off like so defensive. So like sometimes I my I have not in my shoulders in this because I'm like trying to defend people all the time or trying to plead this case of just like, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, you're not doing anything wrong besides just saying like, this isn't right. This isn't OK. And so even as we to you, Zach, yes, I remember back then feeling like, well, you have to do it. This is just how it is. You got to pay your dues. Everybody's paying their dues. And now I'm looked at a certain way because I'm just like, oh, I thought that was just the pay your dues part of the career. Okay, no, I, I'm not going for that now because I've paid my dues. Oh, you mean this is just the longevity of our careers? This is just how it is. And, you know, I I felt bad for the things I felt like I had to just, like I said, put on the back end, hey, rush and get off the clock, you know, but it's like no more. And I, me and Nicholas have definitely been advocates for our union. I'm like, you, we have to know our worth and our value. And it starts within yourself. And now, you know, it's been for a while for me. It's just like, if it doesn't line up with me, I get those knots in my stomach, my neck, something in my gut. I'm not saying no job is perfect. You're always going to, it's always going to be high demand, high stress, but you know, when you're really not being treated right. And I'm okay to either walk away or not accept because I'm just like, I have to know my worth at this point. I've paid my dues. I work my butt off. You're getting an asset when you get me. And I feel as a whole, our union needs to, and all the other unions need to respond that way. Like I've been saying on a lot of our calls, it's a two-way relationship. So as 
I need that show or, but they, producers need us. Like even when everybody was afraid to strike, like, you know, they're just going to get non-union. I'm like, where's this hall of non-union people that are just so great. That's going to just come in on all these shows and take the place of all of our work. I kind of want to see it happen. I think it'd be kind of a, I I felt the same way. Like, you know what, like, like, let me get some popcorn. Right. Yeah, I want to watch like, this. It's, it's, this is underground world that's just waiting to rush in here. And they've been and it's like, stop it. It's just a scared and fear tactic. And the more you buy into it will never be treated properly. Will always be even with meal penalties. It's in sometimes I used to just look at producers and go, this is a union show, right? Because they make you feel like you're you're being greedy. Oh, my God. A meal. Pen- you really want to put down a meal. Pen- it's all these tactics. So it's your turn, Nicholas, I've said enough, but I think we just need to stand on that we have to know our value and we have to stand together. My sincerest apologies for this brief interruption, but if you are a creative professional who spends long hours at your desk and you are searching for a simple and affordable solution to optimize both your energy and your focus, not only is the following promo not an interruption, but listening has the potential to change your life. Here is a brief excerpt from a recent interview that I did with ErgoDriven co-founder and CEO Kit Perkins, the creator of the Topomat, who's here today to talk about his newest product, New Standard Whole Protein. I'm into health and fitness generally, but I want it to be simple and straightforward. About a year, year and a half ago, I started adding collagen into my protein shakes and man, the benefits were like more dramatic than any supplement I've ever seen. So I thought if I can just get this down to coming out of one jar and it's ingredients that I know I can trust and you just put it in water and you don't have to think about it. When people think of protein powders, they think, well, I don't want to get big and bulky and that's not what this is about. To me, this is about repair. So a big part of what we're talking about here is you are what you eat. Your body's constantly repairing and rebuilding and the only stuff it can use to repair and rebuild is what you've been eating unfortunately as the years have gone by every day getting out of bed it's like you know two or three creaks and pops in the first couple steps and that i thought you just sort of live with now but yeah once starting the collagen daily or near daily it's just gone so for us job 1a here was make sure it's high quality and that's grass-fed 100 pasture raised cows and then the second thing if you're actually going to do it every day it needs to be simple it needs to taste good well my goal is that for anybody that is a creative professional like myself that's stuck in front of a computer, number one, they're doing it standing on a topo mat. Number two, they've got a glass of new standard protein next to them so they can just fuel their body, fuel their brain. So uh, you and I, my friend, one edit station at a time are going to change the world. And even better for your listeners with code OPTIMIZE on either a one-time purchase or that first subscribe and save order, 50% off. So if you do that subscribe and save, that's 20% off and 50% off with code OPTIMIZE. That's a fantastic deal. If you're looking for a simple and affordable way to stay energetic, focused, and alleviate the chronic aches and pains that come from living at your computer, I recommend New Standard Whole Protein because it's sourced from high quality ingredients that I trust and it tastes great. To place your first order, visit optimizeyourself.me slash new standard and use the code optimize for 50% off your first order. I agree. And like, I just want to like go back to the producer thing and, you know, something that we talked with Zach with uh, about before we started the show is, is, is how we need to, how the business needs to change for these things. And uh, like a perfect example of how the business has changed to accommodate something. When I started, there used to be like four producers, not including the UPM and the line producer. But now you look at a TV show, there's 10, 12, 15 features, 20 producers. So <laughs> they have found the money mm-hmm. to accommodate all of these producers who I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know who half of them are on any show that I'm on because they're really not doing a day-to-day thing on the show. So if they can find the money for all these producers to participate in the show, how come they can't figure out a way for us to make a, a film or television show with, without killing ourselves? Yeah. And, and, and at a rate that is a living wage. Yes. Here would be my response to that. And I don't know this for a fact. I don't think it's about finding a way. I don't think it's them realize, them thinking to themselves, they're not in these rooms saying, we have to figure out a way to make it better for everybody. We just don't know the answer. Let's brainstorm. Like, let, let's, let's, let's have a mind meld and let's really figure out how do we solve this problem. They don't want to fix it because right. for them, 
it works. There is nothing to fix because they know that we're all expendable and replaceable. And to, to, for all the love and respect in the world to all the professionals that do what we do at the highest level, Hollywood is the epicenter of the world, frankly, as far as the entertainment industry is concerned. Yes, of course, there's Bollywood and China's got a big market. I don't want to put anything against them, but the best of the best in the world come to Hollywood. And the best and the best of Hollywood can't make their flipping days. You think you're going to replace all of us with people that have never done this before <laughs> when we can't make our days? We can't finish the call Here. sheet. We can't get through the schedule. I can't meet my deadlines. And I've been doing this for decades. You're going to find somebody on the street that has a credit card and knows all the thrift stores on Melrose. Yeah. And they're going to be able to do this equally as good or even better. Like, come on, give me a break. Right. I know. And at the beginning of my career, they were using filming cameras. Imagine that. And so the the UPM would be on set. And like after so many takes, he'd be like, you got it. You're done. Moving on. Now, because it's videotape, you know, now because they record it, it they can like do 10, 15, 20. You know, it is increase the days exponentially. Yeah, I've, I've heard that about the uh, the running cameras and having lots of footage. That that, that happens to be the... <laughs> I, I've seen it once or twice. What, what I've always told people when I want to explain the hierarchy of how Hollywood works, I say that you've got this giant mountain of all these different departments, right? And the shit always rolls to the bottom of the hill and editorial, we're the janitors at the bottom that are cleaning up all of the messes because that's where it all ends up, right? Wow. right. So yeah, you, the, that's a whole different soapbox as far as the amount of footage we get and cameras rolling endlessly and getting 15 series inside a take. And like what we used to get, like, and I didn't uh, edit professionally in the film days, but I was coming up during the film days and I've worked um, as an assistant on some stuff. And I've talked to other editors. I've talked to tons of editors, like, you know, legendary editors that worked in film. And they'd say, on average, you'd get between one to two hours worth of footage a day, manageable. A normal day for me now is probably five hours. But you get other days where you get eight or nine. And when I was working on, I have no problem naming the show, burning this bridge because I burned it long ago. But I worked on, <laughs> M I worked on Empire the first two seasons. Oh. Um, and maybe you guys may or may not have heard Empire had a little bit of a reputation. Um, and on my very first day, season two, I walked into the office and they said yesterday they shot two music numbers and you've got approximately eight to nine hours worth of dailies. How quickly can we see a first assembly? Like meaning what time today? And I said, I'm not cutting 10 minutes worth of music numbers from eight hours of footage by the end of the day. Like, wow. can we reset our expectation? Like, what do you mean? Like, let me just walk you through hour by hour how this yeah. process works. Let me help you understand what it takes to be able to deliver something at that level. It's going to take me 12 hours just to watch the footage right. and just to organize it and just to break it down before you can look at one single frame cut with another frame. And I think that that's one of the biggest problems. And that's what I want to get to now is where I think the universal issue is that we do not have enough people in all of the various departments that are using the following word. No, no, I can't meet this expectation. I am one of the best at what I do. And unfortunately, this expectation cannot be met. Let's come up with an alternative. And I feel like uh, using your word, saying that we've been conditioned, using your word, Nicholas, we've been brainwashed. We've been brainwashed to believe this is the only option, mm -hmm. right. but I don't believe that it is. I believe if, the, if we all collectively start to set much clearer boundaries, and I'm not saying let's hope that the contract sets the boundaries for us because they're not going to. The contract is going to get us inches, maybe inches if we're lucky. Right. The contract does not create the paradigm shift. And I think one of the reasons everybody is so angry is they said, oh my God, things are finally going to change and my quality of life is going to get better. Bad news, yeah. not happening overnight with a contract, but I do believe that we can really significantly start to move the needle if we all collectively just say, no, I'm not going to just forego the, the forced call or I'm not going to you know, pretend there's no meal penalty. You are going to give me what I'm due. So even if we just enforce the existing contracts, I feel like the quality of our lives gets better. It's not going to completely change, but it gets better by just setting boundaries. Yes. And yeah, you're absolutely right with that, Zach. Um, I I believe wholeheartedly in boundaries. I'm a boundary setter. I love a good boundary, you know. And so my thing, even on my you know last show, which I got along with the producers, of course, pretty well, and they were telling me we did the pilot, and so because there wasn't a much as much prep time, you know, the designer and I said this is what we really need to get the job done in this short amount of prep time. Okay, they pretend like, oh my God, we don't have the budget. Okay, 
all right, we're going to give it to you. But believe me, it was already like pilot set to shoot. You know, they already had episodes picked up. We're not, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get that when it goes to series. I said, okay, we will discuss. You know, like, how can you tell me or tell us during prep, like, this is, we'll assess the situation as the scripts come in and the demands. And so what the producers are saying, what this show is going to be like, is completely different what the creative is saying, the directors, the writers. And I, I, I could see it so clearly, the trick that they do. The producers are basing off of like, oh, very easy show, lighthearted, da, 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 like dumbing it all the way down. And that's how they make their budgets. That's how they create the amount of crew that they have. Can I, can I just interject really quickly? Okay. No, these budgets are made in an office by people who have never been on a film or television set before in their lives. And they make this budget and they say, this is what you can do it for. Yeah. And it's complete bull cocky. <laughs> like exactly. it's like just bull pucky. It is like just a, a, this like dream of how they're going to do the, the series. And I'm yeah, sure that- and, and it's based off of the best case scenarios. Like, you know, so it's, it's not realistic basically. So anyway, after we did the pilot, I said, great. So we did the pilot and we barely got through. So this is what we need. We still need this crew. Oh no, Shayla, we worked on other shows like this. All they had in this department was one, you know, the the, the (laughs) designer, no ACD, you know, like, I mean, bare minimals. And I looked at them and I said, just because that's what they had does not mean that that's what was needed and it was done correctly. So if you can give me the names of the show, you know, I would love to see how it really worked. And they were like flabbergasted. And then I had to say it again. They go, huh? I said, just because that's what you guys have been doing doesn't mean it's OK and it's done right. So if the correct way you want me to do it and this is the way I'm willing to work, I need this, 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 this. Or I'm not going to be able to like, I can't guarantee you my services. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to have to come back to you. No problem. And I kind of gave the tone of I'm willing to walk. You're not going to kill me. You're not going to kill the rest of the crew. There's absolutely, I'm not an overly greedy person. There's no way though we can do it with a three to four person man crew. And so they came back and a lot of, you know, of course, It's always just like, well, we'll do this for the first five episodes, you know, and you just play this game and you keep asking. But the point is, we have to be designers need to work with the supervisors, supervisors or whatever department heads need to assess. Or I talk to my crew if some big episode is coming up. Hey, what do you think you need to my key to get this done, to not feel overwhelmed, you know? And they'll say, I really think we need two to three BG costumers. And that's what I fight for, you know? And so it's hard. It's a lot of work and it's happening more, but it's a nature of like, you just get what you're given. But it's also, you know, like I was on a show, so it was a network. I did a network show and the line producer knew exactly what costumes did and how important costumes are. So we had three keys and we each had a credit card with a $50,000 limit. Now, a lot of line producers feel that they can control the budget magically by giving you a a lesser amount on your credit card. And so then I was on another show that it was in its second season. They eventually figured out how important costumes were. But the, you know, the two seasons that I was there, it's like our credit card, like I'd be at a store. It was declined. I'm like, well, I can't, I guess, I guess you don't want, you know, to do that fitting with Carrie. Like, you know, I guess it's not going to happen. Next thing you know, it's, it's raised. Then I like, I went to the line producer. I'm like, why won't you just raise our limits so that we can do our jobs? That's all we want to do. We just want to make sure that their costumes, the actors are happy. She goes, oh, you know what? The network won't let us. And I go, that's so funny because the job I did right before this one, I had a 50, it was the same network and I had a $50,000 limit. All you have to do is call. Yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing how how uh, how people are able to to even walk upright with all the time they spend passing the buck all day long, isn't it? Yeah. You think that would be so much more exhausting, uh, but people find a way to summon the energy to pass the buck constantly all day long. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm sure you've probably heard this saying before. Oh, but you don't understand. There is no more money. Right. Yes. Have you heard that before? Because I know I've heard it before. Oh, are you kidding? But there is no more money. Exactly. And then the, then the actor is like, their car breaks down and they're like, you know what? 
<laughs> and then all of a sudden there's all this money to rearrange the schedule and do this and, and buy them a new car and this and that. Yeah. And I'm, I would guess that in the, the costume side, you can uh, relate to something similar, but I've been uh, literally, like you said, the, the Chipotle thing, I have a story almost exactly the same where I've been told, uh, we, we saw your lunch order uh, and we're going to need you to return the soup. I'm like, Excuse me? They're like, well, the, the soup sent you over a budget. You can get the meal. We're going to need you to return the soup. And I said, well, number one, it's already arrived. So I'm not going to have the delivery person. And this was on a Saturday, by the way. I was working wow. a Saturday. Oh. And I need you to return the soup. But then, of course, the next week is, hey, we, we'd like to, to use ACDC uh, in the show. They're like, oh, what's the bu- 125K? Yeah, no problem. We can get that. I'm like, but I had to return the soup? Really? <laughs> yeah. Somebody that's like loyal working with you. Yeah. And yeah, and now I'm to the point I'm just like, yeah, well, based off what you want, like there's no more money. And I'm just like, yeah, okay, do you want this or do you, you know, like we can go to Target. This is the budget you're giving me, you know, or talk to the creative director, you know, creator or the, you know, you just have to like, I'm just like, okay, yeah, like I don't want them to be in this. This is what you guys were trying to provide a service. And I just kind of figure out ways to throw it back at them. Like, this is just what I need. So either I put it to the producer, either you want to have the conversation. That's not my job to go to the writer or the director and go back and forth. They've personally asked for this. So you can, you know, go talk to them and let me know. But at this point, you know, that's not my job. We're the liaison person or the network or are you were on the call. That's what I always say to the producer. Like you were on the call or you were in the meeting. You know, I we pitched this, but then they said they wanted a custom blah, 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 you know? And they're like, yeah, that's true. You're right. Like, okay, let me give you a call back. And then you just kind of hear no answer and I just proceed then. <laughs> mm-hmm, exactly. So <laughs> I'm like, uh, no answer means, okay, I don't want to really say I approved it. But basically, I didn't have the balls to go tell, you know, the network or the creative, you know, that we're, you're not going to get the the role that you saw in Vogue magazine. Or yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah I'm like, uh, one, one of the most like legendary costume stories, there's a huge costume supervisor. I won't say his name because I'm going to botch the story. But basically, the story goes, the producer comes to him and says, Listen, you need to get this done with this, this, and this, with this amount of money. And he goes, no, I need lawn furniture. You need costumes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, the no, like, do you want the costumes or not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I know that we could go down uh, even darker, deeper rabbit holes of all the stories for hours. But where I want to lead this is with some actionable steps that I believe that people can take. Um, I'm going to lead with one that I believe can make a difference. And then I want to hear it directly from your departments, from your worlds, what you think can start to make a difference. Because it's one thing for us to all complain about how bad things are. And I think that the, the level of awareness that's out there is absolutely vital. Because up until, I mean, frankly, even less than a year ago, the awareness was wasn't there. Um, so I don't know if you guys uh, were a part of all this or not in the costume department, but about a year ago, I wrote an article that was called Dear Hollywood, We Don't Want to Go Back to Normal, Normal Wasn't Working. And it was the first time that anything that I had written had gone beyond the world of post-production and the creative world. And there were people on six continents that were reaching out, not even in the union or in Hollywood, uh, like 150,000 people read it in less than a week. And like, I didn't even know there were that many people on the internet. It was like numbers I couldn't comprehend. Um, and it was when everybody just started to have this kernel of awareness that, oh, maybe it's not just me. And now I feel like everybody is saying, and we're realizing these are not these isolated stories. This is the reality that everybody lives. Now that the awareness is there, I want to be a part of the solution. And I want to start to figure out how do we change this and fix this? Because it's not just going to be a vote on a contract. It's a lot bigger than that. So what I want to start with, and then I want you guys to piggyback with any ideas you have, is I think one of the very first steps, which you somewhat alluded to, Shayla, is this idea that whenever I personally am interested in a job, I want to know one thing. I have a whole bunch of questions, but I want to know one thing. When I show up at the job on day one, are you setting me up for success or failure? If you're going to set me up for failure because of the budgets, because of the deadlines, and it doesn't matter how great I am at my job, I'm going to either have to kill myself to deliver or I'm going to be made to look a fool because I can't deliver. I'm not going to work for you. And I'm literally just going to say, no, I'm sorry. This isn't a good fit. I'm unavailable. If I know that somebody wants to set me up for success, 
then I am all in. And yeah, I'll work some long hours and I'll be in the trenches when I need to when the deadlines are crazy, as long as that's not the norm. If the exception is that things are gonna be tough and we have to band together and deliver, I love that part of the process. Frankly, my favorite memories from the last three seasons of Cobra Kai are when I was in the trenches. It's like, oh my God, we've got this episode, we gotta deliver, it's the finale, this is awesome. I'm, but I love that part. And the difference is that everybody respects me. Everybody treats me with respect. They know that I need the time to do the work and we're just in the trenches together. That's being set up for success. If I work on shows where I'm set up for failure, I'm out. I'm just not going to do it. And you just got to figure it out. So I think the, the first step for a lot of people is just asking, am I either working with people or will I be working with people that want to set me up to be successful or the want to set me up to fail? Yes, absolutely. So I would love to know a couple of suggestions that either of you have for how we can affect some form of meaningful change. Well, you can go to the person if this is time. <laughs> it's just because she wants to, she just wants to have the last word. That's all. You know, uh, well, I, I'm just, I'm going to roll this into it because it's kind of baked into costumers. We're one of the lowest paid departments in the business. And I really believe in my heart, not with any proof or evidence that it's because we're 80% women, you know, 10% men and like 10% and like 10% gay men or, or, um, you know, LGBTQ uh, community. And then, uh, people who are immigrants, which is most of our custom made. So like, on the, on the, I, I think we should ask for more money. I think what all customers should decide if we don't get this amount of money, then we're not gonna do the job because we deserve to be paid more. People do not value the work that we do. Um, and then in the same way to say that we're not gonna work this many hours. That once you get to 12 hours on the set, that you pull the plug and like the crew walks off and says, it's not our problem. That the director didn't get his day because we did our work, you know? So I, th I think that we all just have to band together all the departments and say, this is like when, when it's getting to be too much to say, this is too much. Boundaries, big word boundaries. for me, setting boundaries, right? So uh, what did you want to add to that, Shayla? I mean, I guess I should have went before Nicholas because I was going you to stole your answer, say, huh? um, <laughs> I know it was a combination, it was a combination, but no, you guys are definitely on the same page as uh, all of us. I think I was going to say sticking together as well as just boundaries, you know, uh, communicating within your department or others. Like it's been a pleasure to hear even your world, Zach. You know, you think, you know, but it's good to hear all the demands like, oh, this amount of footage. So, you know, you're not in the same boat. So I feel like discussing to one another uh, and communicating and setting boundaries. Like I said, when I go into a project, I ask certain questions. And this last project, literally, it was like I felt the rates were low. I tried to negotiate as high as I could for the crew, you know, as well as myself. And I negotiated $10 higher for the supervisor. Not saying that, oh, I was making this boo boo, but they were on the lower scale. Right. But, she, you know, she kept being like, oh, I don't know. That's never. Uh, and I just played like, oh, I think you have the wrong rate. You know, <laughs> maybe you need to call my union. I always call my union. I tell them about the contract. But I had the tone of, yeah, this is the lowest I can. I can't do it for this. I can't. I wasn't worried about not getting the job, not being hired. I was just like, I just can't. So then she came back like, Oh, yeah, you know what? I might have mixed up the rates. Mm. You know, let me get back to you, you know, because I was just like, oh, I'm so honored. I would love to, but I just can't accept it. You know, like I just can't. I didn't have another job inside in mind, but I just know my work. Of course, she came back, honored the rate. So I, the highest I can get for the crew was like a dollar something more, you know, and it's like after that, it's like absolutely no more, Shayla. But what I encouraged the crew when they were asking me, Shayla, is there any more? This is a little low for the rate. And I knew it was. And I'm like, hey, I, I encourage you to go talk to the producer. They're like, you know, we always hear in our union that we can negotiate, but we've never had that avenue. And that's how I felt as a costumer. I felt like, oh, I could tell the supervisor was maybe a little timid or one of those, like the old culture of, you know, you're lucky to be working. And that's now how I feel. So I never mm -hmm. wanted to go over my supervisor's head, but I was like, if you're too afraid to ask, can I just negotiate my, I'm not afraid to ask. 
So the crew was so surprised. I said, hey, if you want to get your feet wet, by any means, this is the line producer's name, the UPM, please go discuss with them. I know I fight for my crew, but I would love if you can get more. You know, maybe these are some pointers. And they were stunned by that. Like, really? Thank you. Is there a kit fee? They said no, but please go discuss that or this is what we can do. So I try to help as well as my crew educate, teach. These are the pointers to go off of. If you can't get a kit rate, ask for this. If you're on a weekly, ask for the daily rate for a guarantee, even if you are weekly. You know, anything I learn, I try to help the next person to just say, to benefit of all of us, you know, we're all in it together and it's worked sometimes, sometimes it's still, but you know, like, oh, put mileage if they're not going to give you a kit rental, you know, like, you know, I don't know who's going to hear this. I don't want to get in trouble, you know, but I'm just like, we need to discuss things and just say like, you know, I kept pushing the envelope. My customers need phone, cell phone, cell phone. So I called the union. I didn't know that there was, we have to get that. Say law. Yeah, we have to get that. No, you're told all these years that it's optional, but we use our cell phones every day, all day without an option. So it's those things that we need to like tell the next person, oh, you get um, maybe, you know, it might equal up to 20 something dollars or 30 at the end of the week. But to fill out the COVID questionnaire, you know, but some shows won't tell you that some might just give it. But you got to learn and then you got to tell the next person. I think we need to to learn to walk away. Oh, yeah. Like, like, to say this is. You know, like when it's too much, it, it, because the thing is, and like what Shayla has just been expressing is they've created this budget and now they're saying they don't have the money for it. And like you were saying earlier, it's like, oh, but we need an ACDC song. It's like, there's always money. You know, I, I, there's always money. I had a similar situation happen this year on a feature where I had done three features. I'm like, this is my rate. And he's like, oh, you know, gosh, we're so over budget already. And I go, okay. Well, I'm sure you find somebody th- that will accept that rate, and I wish you all the best. And he goes, "Is that a deal breaker?" And I go, "Yeah." I go, <laughs> sure, I don't, yeah. I don't work in this business to subsidize movies. I I do it to pay my mortgage. Yes, and it starts with the rates because if you if you go into it feeling low low balled or taken advantage of, it sets the tone. It makes. You know, like when I was on that show, I felt good because I stood up for myself. I was willing to walk away. So the things that came my way, I was willing to deal with because I knew that, oh, I got $10 more than what they were willing to offer me. But if I would have, everything would have been like, and you're paying me this and this, you know, it's a disgruntled employee center and you don't want to work like that. It's not, it's not healthy. It's toxic. It's a toxic environment. So I know for me, I have to be true to myself. I have to set boundaries so I can be a good example and a leader for the department. If not, you're just that's when you all all day, everybody's talking about, oh, the rates suck, all this, they're taking advantage of us, but you have a choice. And I preach that to everybody. It's the power of choice. Yep, I couldn't agree with that more. And to to sum all of that up, to kind of, you know, to bring it all back together, because as the editor, I always want to take a lot of information and tell a very concise and tight story. Um, I always tell my coaching and mentorship students that I work with that it's, you know, the quality of your life is always about asking better questions. The first question that I introduced is, are these people going to set me up for success or failure? And I think if I were to wrap up everything that both of you said into a single question, are the people that I'm going to work with value me and respect me? And that's what they're paying you. That's the way that they treat you, whether it's for a meal break or anything else. Yeah, they're going to be long days and we're all going to be in the trenches together. And if I'm working with people that are only going to ask me to do things they would do themselves, then I know they respect me and value me. And then it is what it is. And I'm just going to manage it and I'm going to deal with it because this is a tough industry. But if I'm being set up for failure and I'm not going to be valued or respected, I am so out. And I cannot, if I were to sum up this whole conversation in one sentence, Nicholas, you win the prize. I think we need to learn how to walk away. Yeah. It's our inability to walk away that's gotten us to where we are now. And we've collectively voted and we got within 24 hours of walking away. And yeah, we snatched uh, we snatched it right out of our hands and we lost it. Yeah. And I don't know if we're going to get that back anytime soon. Um, but I really, it is about our collective individual abilities to walk away because we're now no longer going to do it as a giant union. And I, I think that one of the toughest things for so many people, I don't know if you guys experienced this, but I read about it, where people left work on Friday or Saturday or whenever thinking, man, 
When we come back to work, I don't know if it's going to be next week or in six months, but it's going to be a whole new world. I cannot wait. And then it's like, oh, shit, I got to go back to work on Monday now, and it's going to be the same crap all over again. Like, talk about demoralizing. Well, it's kind of like COVID. Yeah. That's that's uh-huh. what everybody thought when we came back. Oh, production is finally going to, like, really slow things down so that we can be safe and healthy and... Yeah. And uh, we, we all know how that worked out. Um, so I, I want I want to wrap it up with one final quick question. Uh, this is a question that I've been asking all of my guests recently and I've gotten some really insightful answers. Um, I'm going to switch it up and I'm going to do Shayla first and then Nicholas because she thought she was going to get the last word and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it up on you guys. Twist ending, <laughs> oh, right? I, I know, I'm kidding. Uh, but as an editor, I get to restructure things. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but the, the benefit that uh, Nicholas will have is he'll know that the questions is, is coming and Shayla won't. But Shayla, Here's what I want you to do. I want you to jump into a time machine and I want you to travel back in time to meet the version of yourself that is green-eyed, bushy-tailed, first morning in the industry. Knowing everything you know now and everything you've been through, what advice do you give yourself? Mm-hmm. Ooh, that's good. Wow, Nicholas, you're lucky. Um, time machine, going back. First advice, do not believe what you're told, pay attention to what's happening. You know, it's not what they're saying, it's what they're doing, you know? So I don't know if that sums it up, but I was promised a lot of things, you know, when I first stepped into the business or we're going to get in the union, the producer, but it was more of like, if I paid attention to how they were using and abusing the non-union and getting free labor or whatever, I, you know, if I knew what I knew now, I would just more of get things in writing or not accept it and the power of walk away. But, you know, you think, oh, this is all a part of it. I'm green, paying my dues. And there's some truth to that. But, you know, just standing my ground earlier as far as like, no, this doesn't feel right. And I know it's not right. What's surprising to me is that given everything we've talked about, I think most everybody would assume your advice would be do anything else with your life, but this, and you didn't. <laughs> and that's the amazing part. I don't think any, I don't, I was going to say nobody would give themselves that advice because we no. absolutely live for what we do. That's why I said in the middle of our, even before we were, we were ahead of it, I was like, the unfortunate thing is, you love your career. You know, of course, it might sound like it because we're trying to bring light into the things that aren't right in our industry. But even like my last show, I what I'm talking about now wasn't directed toward those producers. Those I felt respected. I felt heard. Yeah, of course, you always got to kind of like tug a war a little bit. But they, we always met in the middle or sometimes I just won the war. Sometimes I had to bend a little and I don't mind working with a producer when I know that. But, you know, we're talking about a grand scheme and the culture of abuse in this business, not maybe every job, every show. But that's because now I have boundaries. I am willing to walk away. I don't accept everything. So, yes, my last few projects, I'm not referring to those because I'm like, oh, no. Oh, thank you for the time. Oh, no, I can feel it. I can hear, like I said, paying attention. I can hear what you're really saying in the meeting, the first meeting. I could feel the games. I could, like you said, setting me up for failure or to win, to succeed. I could, And so now I like, I don't play around with that. I love all of that. And now Nicholas has the benefit of cheating off of your answers right. and I can't catch him off guard. So he's had like three minutes to be like, oh, I can beat that. I can so beat that. So same question. Yeah. You're, you're, I, and I want to reiterate it for anybody that, uh, that doesn't remember because it's a really important setup. You're jumping in a time machine and you're going to talk to yourself, whatever that first morning is where you walk out the door and the sky is blue and the air is fresh and you're like, I'm going to do it. Today is the day that I start my career in Hollywood. What do you tell yourself? So I'm going to preface this really quickly, just to touch on what Shayla said. And that is, I've worked for many producers who care deeply for their crews. And, you know, it's kind of like Yelp. It's like, you know, when you, you always write a review if you're pissed off, but it's like, you don't say anything if you had a great experience. So I just, I just, I want to, I don't want people to come away from this podcast thinking that it's like hell on earth because I've had really positive experiences in my career as well. Agreed. I I second that. Mm -hmm. But, but I will, but if I could go back and tell myself, I would say, 
you have the power to advocate for yourself. Yes. Which a lot of times I really believe, you know, when you're young and in the industry, you just try and do whatever you can to make it work and do whatever's asked of you. And I just think that if, if, if in a calm way you explain to somebody, just like you were talking about uh, with, uh, you know, editing 10 minutes of two musical numbers, if, if you just explain to them why it's really not going to help you or them, then usually they'll, they'll hear it. But you have to do it in a way that they'll listen. You know, you, you can't be angry. You have to like say, well, really, this is what it's going to take. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And uh, I've told my students more than once that whenever there's a problem, don't go to people with problems, go to them with solutions. Here's the problem, but yes. here's the potential solution. Here's why it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And here are multiple ways to address it. Maybe it's not the way that you want because you want it to magically happen. It might take a little bit of extra money, may take a little bit of extra time. But if everybody here is interested in quality, fast, cheap, good, you get to pick two, which two are the most important. And usually when you can frame it that way with potential solutions, they listen and you advocate for yourself and then you end up doing the, the job and you end up succeeding. So um, on that note, I feel like we've just warmed up and we've been going forever. Uh, and I, I told you guys we were just going to pull the string and we were going to go. And this is super exciting. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely loved it. Uh, but great. I want to be respectful of uh, your time. And I know that for you guys, it's like the middle of the day right now because um, you're used to going until <laughs> six in the morning on a Friday. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm fragile and I like to get my sleep. Um, but on that note, I want to thank uh, both you, Shayla and Nicholas, for uh, being here and for sharing your stories. And I hope uh, that uh, we can affect some positive change and inspire people to advocate for themselves and stand up for themselves and be respected and valued. And I hope that this leads to more conversations similar to this one. So thank you so much for being here with me this evening. Thank you, Zach. We really appreciate it. And everybody stay involved. And keep talking. Thank you so much, Zach. It's really important to have this platform a place to uh, share with people so that they understand what it is that we're fighting for. Yeah, commend you for stepping out. You know, it, it's not easy to do stuff like this. So we appreciate it. Yep, and I, I appreciate you both. So thank you so much. Thanks, Zach. Have a good night. Cheers. See you, Nicholas. Be safe. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss future interviews just like this one, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. And super quick, before you leave today, don't forget that every Monday morning, I'm sharing all of my favorite resources, strategies, and practical tips to help you pursue more fulfilling work and design a more balanced life without sacrificing your health, your relationships, relationships or your sanity in the process. To subscribe 100% free, simply visit optimizeyourself.me slash newsletter. And once again, a special thank you to our sponsor, Ergo Driven, for making today's interview possible. To learn more about Ergo Driven and my favorite product for standing workstations, the Topo Mat, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Topo. That's T-O-P-O. To learn more about ErgoDriven and their brand new product that I'm super excited about, New Standard Whole Protein, visit optimizeyourself.me slash new standard. Thank you for listening. Stay safe, healthy, and sane, and be well.